Good morning, everyone. We'll start in just a, a few minutes, if that's okay. We're just waiting for people to join by the uh, event bright. Good morning, Cambodia, Good morning, Philippines. Good morning, Myanmar. Good morning, China. Good morning, Australia. Good morning, Thailand. So good morning. Good morning all and uh, welcome to our ASEAN Environmental Law Conference, our stories and solutions in challenging times. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all uh, with us today. Um, and I'm very, very excited that you're able to uh, join us all. Um, from all around uh, the region. Um, and I know this afternoon we will also be um, having people from uh, um, Europe, uh, where it's a little bit early in the morning there, 3 a.m. Um, so I would like to introduce myself. My name is Matthew Baird. I'm the uh, director of the Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law. Um, and I would certainly like to very much welcome you um, to this conference today. Um, we were very fortunate that um, the, um, the uh, number of people uh, who uh, joined us um, has exceeded our expectations. Um, we have over 800 registrations uh, for the three days of this event. So thank you all very much for your assistance and support uh, in joining us. Um, I'd like very quickly, uh, because we've got a lot of things and a lot of great uh, speakers today, um, to just make uh, three points um, in welcoming you to the conference. Um, the first is to dedicate this conference to the earth rights defenders, the environmental and human rights defenders, and the lawyers who represent the planet uh, under challenging and very, very difficult circumstances. Um, not only because of COVID, but the ongoing challenges of violence and intimidation. Um, we read just at the end of last year in the Philippines where nine Tumadoc indigenous people were killed and 10 others were arrested in a police operations on Panay Islands um, in what rights groups have labeled the massacre. Uh, and this is an ongoing series of challenges that we face uh, in order to try and do our work into protecting the planet. Um, Ariel has decided that we are going to be working on a project this year with lawyers uh, who represent the environment and environmental defenders 
so that we can remind all lawyers uh, and the relevant bar associations and law societies uh, throughout the region that there are legal and professional obligations to support your fellow lawyers uh, and uh, human rights environmental defenders at all times. This is not an option for lawyers. This is our legal and professional obligations to support our fellow practitioners who are working to defend uh, the environment. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is to thank the Ariel team, um, our 25 speakers and our conference supporters. Um, without you, this could not have been possible and it could not have been possible to make it free of charge to everyone across the region. Um, to Paolo and Pum, uh, who have been working uh, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes uh, to ensure the technical things happen. Uh, I thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, to Susu, Rocky and Subai uh, from the Philippines, Thailand and Myanmar, thank you for your work in the preparation of the program. Uh, to our speakers and moderators, thank you for your work uh, and for your time and commitment uh, in being able to present uh, this over the next three days. And to the 11 supporting organizations, you have been incredible. Um, the UN Environment Program, uh, Law Asia, the National Environmental Law Association of Australia, Greenpeace Philippines, uh, Earth Rights International, uh, eLaw Worldwide, the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide, the Centre for International Law at the National University of Singapore, the Myanmar Environmental Law Society, uh, Law Services, um, and Living Ladato Sea in the Philippines, uh, Indonesia Oceans Justice Initiative, uh, and the College of Law Australia. Um, thank you all for your support. Um, and for promoting and supporting uh, this important conference. The final thing I would like to say is to acknowledge that this is really an important and an exceptional year for the planet. Um, this is the year we must turn things around. With the Oceans Conference coming up this year, the Biodiversity Conference in Kunming later in the year, uh, we must put the planet first. We must strive with everything we can to put the environment before profit. Um, we must support Indigenous people uh, in protecting these last biodiversity hotspots, the people that have cared for our planet for thousands of generations. We must respect and acknowledge their extraordinary work and the wonderful things that they are doing. And we must ensure that we can support them and uh, in their endeavours and their aspirations. But this year is the year for the planet, whether it's climate change, biodiversity or oceans, this is the year we must make the difference and we must change business as usual into a real business unusual where we put people and the planet before the profits. We must think that this is the year we must use environmental rule of law to have big wins for the future of the planet uh, and our animals. Um, this is the year for solution and action. This is the year of planetary defenders. And this year in, on Friday, we will celebrate two outstanding environmental lawyers uh, Emeritus Professor Koking Leng from Singapore and Attorney Iram Asan from Pakistan, outstanding environmental lawyers that are really shining extraordinary light on the work that we do. Uh, we all need mentors and we also need to celebrate those who made a significant contributions to environmental law. And we hope that this will be the first in a series of awards every year to support and promote environmental lawyers who are going beyond the call of duty uh, to create an environmental rule of law. Uh, all of our speakers have done so. Um, we have blessed with many, many amazing speakers uh, who have agreed to present over the next three days. Um, so I would now like to introduce uh, Georgina Lloyd. Uh, Georgie is the Regional Coordinator for Asia and the Pacific for the Environmental Law and Governance Program in Bangkok uh, for the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, and Georgina, I'd like to call on you to introduce our first keynote address. And thank you very much um, for being with us today. Thank you very much, Matthew. The United Nations Environment Program is delighted to support the ASEAN Environmental Law Conference. This is an incredibly important conference being convened at a time when environmental rule of law is increasingly critical as a necessary foundation for environmental protection and enforcement in order to create resilience to environmental crises, to stop environmental crime and to reduce future pandemic risks. I am equally delighted to introduce the keynote speaker, Emeritus Professor Ben Boer, who will speak on the environment, human rights and environmental justice. Enabling environmental justice alongside effective, accountable, inclusive and transparent institutions is critical to promote environmental rule of law 
and the realization of human rights, including environmental rights. I am sure that this presentation will provide the important context and set the tone for the remainder of the conference. Emeritus Professor Bohr held a position of Professor in Environmental Law between 1992 and 2008, and was appointed Emeritus Professor of the University of Sydney in 2009. He is Distinguished Professor of Law at the Research Institute uh, of Environmental Law in Wuhan University, China from 2011 to 2020. And he's a recognized 1000 Talents Program expert. Professor Bo was Deputy Chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law between 2012 and 2016. He is a member of the Board of Governors of the International Council of Environmental Law and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Law. Professor Bohr has published on a wide range of topics of environmental and heritage law topics, including the converging regimes of human rights and environmental protection in international law. There is no better person to open this conference, and I am delighted to say, Professor Bohr, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, firstly, Matthew, and then also to Georgina Lloyd for your wonderful introduction. I can only hope today to deal with a very small aspect of a very large topic. Uh, so I will focus on basic definitions and principles, hopefully being able then to set the scene for our discussions in the next few days. I wanted to congratulate Matthew and the team at the Aerial First uh, in terms of putting together such a fine list of speakers and topics, uh, which by the end of the three days, I'm sure everyone will be exhausted. Uh, that everybody will be exhausted by the end of it. In any case, today I'm going to be talking uh, about environment, uh, human rights and environmental justice. And I'll just share my screen. And hopefully you can see that. So The topic that I'm addressing today is increasingly central to the consideration of the operation of the environmental legal system at international, regional and at national levels. I want to promote one particular proposition. Sorry, Ben. Um, um, yes. We're currently in um, uh, presenter mode. But, um, yes. Thank you. Just a moment. Can you see that better now? Um, it, you've still got the two slides on the screen. Yes, okay. I just have to re restart or... Right, just a moment. Not sure how we can actually get rid of that, Matthew. Okay. Just, there it is. Is that better? Okay. So, if everybody can see this now, um, I'll just uh, reiterate. I wish to promote a proposition that the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment must be recognised at international, regional, and at national levels. I argue that. The recognition and implementation of environmental rights are basic to the promotion of the environmental rule of law and in the context of this conference are fundamental to the achievement of environmental justice, both for people and for nature. Certainly at the international level, we are seeing a growing movement for the recognition of this right. At regional level in ASEAN, we also see this right starting to be recognized, firstly in the Human Rights Declaration that I'll talk a little bit about, and then also at a national level. But one of the important things that we need to recognize, certainly 
really since 1972, uh, is that the disciplines of human rights and environmental law are increasingly converging. And uh, Georgie referred to an article of mine which sets out these convergences. They're converging both with particular respect to principles as well as foundational concepts of both regimes and they're increasingly being recognized as being consistent with each other. So in my very brief talk today, I will talk about uh, the meaning of environmental justice and then the various ways in which environmental rights in ASEAN countries can be achieved uh, as part of that uh, broader idea of achieving environmental justice. The US EPA, as one example, defines environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement all, of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income, with respect to, or in the context of development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws. Now, although this definition is US specific and there are many considerations uh, that apply in the US that might not apply necessarily uh, elsewhere, overall, uh, the idea uh, is the correct one in terms of fair treatment and meaningful involvement. And meaningful involvement, meaningful involvement particularly, of course, relates to issues of public participation. When we think about environmental justice in ASEAN, we see that a number of regional institutions, and in particular, I'm referring here to the Asian Development Bank and the UN Environment Programme, that uh, these institutions have been working for some years with a range of people, judges, academics, government officials, to further the cause of environmental justice uh, through conferences, meetings, roundtables, and other forms of capacity building. But in the last few years, these initiatives have particularly included a consideration of environmental human rights. One of the things that I would want to argue is that when we consider environmental law, we can perceive an implicit right to a quality environment. If that implicit right was not there, what would be the point of environmental law at any of the levels that we're talking about, international, regional, or national? It seems to me that at each of these levels, environmental law, nature conservation, and heritage law harbor the right to a quality environment as an underlying premise. And certainly, that right to a quality environment that I'll extrapolate on in a moment is increasingly being recognized as a significant aspect of human rights. We can see this convergence in many multilateral environmental agreements, as well as in statements on human rights. When we think about environmental rights for people and communities, we need to divide them into two. One, procedural rights, which are the basic legal rights of access to information, right to participation uh, and access to justice, as well as a right to legal remedies in the courts and other tribunals. The other aspect, of course, is substantive rights. And this is one that I would want to focus on. The most fundamental of them is, of course, the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. One aspect of this, which I'll look at now, is the question of environmental justice principles, uh, which go to recognize and to promote and implement uh, the, uh, these substantive and procedural rights. One example is the 2016 IUCN Declaration on the Environmental Rule of Law. Without going into detail, we can see that there are 13 principles that form the central part of the declaration and they are aimed at promoting and achieving environmental justice through the environmental rule of law. Principle three contains the right to environment. Each human present and future has the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. 
Of course, there are many ways of formulating uh, this definition, but this is one that is increasingly being accepted. One of the things that we can think about, though, is what quality of environment are we aiming at? And should that differ from one region or country to another, from a city environment to a rural, env rural environment? And this is something that we need to think about in terms of classifying the various definitions, as well as the practices at national level in terms of trying to achieve a quality environment. When we go back to 1972, we see that there is already a recognition, but not legally enforceable, uh, of uh, this uh, idea of a right to a good environment, uh, a fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well being. So, this is one of the fundamental documents that was put forward already many years ago. But then we see a number of other statements coming out uh, in a range of documents. For example, in 1992, we have principle one, uh, placing humans at the center of concerns for sustainable development, entitled to, uh, a, to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. But it's not a very strong statement. And one of the questions I would have for you is whether we need a much stronger statement, one that is legally enforceable. Matthews referred to the uh, issues of Indigenous people, and we see in 2007 the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, including a substantive provision on the environment, although it doesn't really refer to a quality uh, of environment as such. The level of quality is something that, in my view, is quite important. But you'll see there in Article 29 uh, that a right to conservation and protection of the environment is spelled out. Then we see in the Sustainable Development Goals of 2015, an implicit right to a quality environment, and especially in goal one, that it's determining to end poverty and hunger in all forms of dimensions, and to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in a healthy environment. This question of dignity, uh, by the way, is a very important one. It's one that James May and others have looked at uh, in more detail in terms of considering the right to a healthy environment. So one of the questions that I have is whether or not we should have a universal right to a, an environment of a particular quality, of a high quality. At the present time, we do not have a legal agreement on this particular issue. And one of the questions is, what form should an agreement take? Many of you will know that a global pact has been negotiated since 2016 through the uh, French uh, Club of Jurists, uh, uh, which has set out a global pact on the environment and incorporates uh, a right to environment. Um, one of the questions that we need to ask in the next year or so is, well, the 2022 United Nations 50th anniversary of the Stockholm Conference produce a satisfactory declaration that includes such a right. At the moment, uh, this is still being negotiated. It's been heavily debated uh, at UN level in the last couple of years. It's an enormous amount of disagreement, both about the, the form and the processes by which uh, such a right should be achieved. So the Global Pact for the Environment is one that we all need to look at and understand, but also realize that uh, it is the basis for an argument rather than the end of the argument. But here we see a right to an ecologically sound environment uh, being recognized, uh, one that is adequate for health, well-being, dignity, culture, and fulfillment. But another aspect of this, which is seen in some national constitutions as well, relating to the environment, is that the pact recognizes a duty to take care of the environment. So on the one, one hand, you've got a recognition of the right to live 
uh, in a healthy environment. But on the other hand, we need to be able to achieve that and therefore putting uh, a duty of care on the state, on international institutions, on individuals to take care of the environment is one that is essential to the achievement of Article 1. Another aspect of this argument uh, is spelled out by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Environment. Uh, that rapporteur is now David Boyd, Professor David Boyd from the University of British Columbia. And in uh, 2017, he put um, uh, the Special Rapporteur uh, put forward a range of uh, general obligations on the part of states concerning the right to environment. And I won't go through all of these, but you'll see them on screen and these PowerPoints will be available to you in due course. But the basic uh, ideas of this link between human rights and environment uh, has become very obvious and important. We see that there are a range of, of obligations here in terms of environmental impact in relation to public access to information, uh, the raising of public awareness, uh, ob the ob obligation to provide a safe and enabling environment, uh, and so on. In particular, it refers to something that Matthew has mentioned, and that is to say the protection of environmental defenders, which has become increasingly important uh, because of the uh, disastrous situation that we see in many countries, including uh, in the Asian region uh, in relation to environmental defenders and harm to them. But here then, as a procedural obligation, every state has an obligation to provide for effective remedies for violations and abuses of human rights related to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And then it goes on to talk about other substantive obligations in terms of the establishment uh, of normative frameworks uh, to guarantee these rights uh, and divide them into both substantive standards relating to climate, pollution, biodiversity and so forth, uh, as well as effective legal and institutional mechanisms. There's also an obligation to cooperate, which is a fundamental aspect, in any case, of international law. There's also reference, of course, to the Sustainable Development Goals, which now have become a central aspect of international environmental policy. Without going into the details, we see that there is an obligation to identify vulnerable people, vulnerable groups that need to be particularly focused on in terms of state obligations. Indigenous people are mentioned, questions of right to land, this issue of free prior and informed consent is very important, especially uh, in countries uh, which harbour, which have in, uh, Indigenous uh, peoples as part or the whole of their population. So one of the issues that comes up in my mind uh, is in terms of thinking through what these state obligations might mean at a regional level and at a national level in terms of environmental law. It seems to me that the state obligations spelled out in the Special Rapporteur's report necessitate a revision of environmental law in many countries. Certainly, if you look at the 10 ASEAN countries and their national environmental legislation, there's a huge amount of variation. There's a huge amount of inconsistency in approach, uh, in inconsistency in definitions. One of the questions I would have for you and for this conference is whether it's time to revisit and to revise the 1985 ASEAN Agreement on the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, or rewrite it completely, uh, take another approach, but nevertheless aim for a legally enforceable regional environmental law. Whatever form it might take in the future, 
clearly consistent legislative approaches need to be encouraged. And these days should also take into account recognition of environmental human rights, as has been done in the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, which I'll mention in a moment. We see in 2012, uh, the ASEAN uh, Human Rights Commission being formed uh, and a human rights declaration being, uh, being published, uh, which every ASEAN country has put its name to. We see that in Article 28, there are a range of rights. The most important one is 28F, the right to a safe, clean and sustainable environment. But if you look a little bit more broadly, you see that the right to adequate, adequate and affordable food, the right to adequate and affordable housing, the right to safe drinking water and sanitation are also part of uh, the right to environment. The question is, how enforceable is this human rights declaration? Many of you will know that it is not in any direct sense enforceable. The Commission has very few powers to actually implement uh, and enforce this declaration. And some consideration should be given in the future to whether or not the rights that you find in the declaration, including environmental rights, can be made legally enforceable. That's not a topic for today, but it's something uh, that perhaps many of you should start to think about. What about national recognition of the right to environment? We see that there are both direct recognition of the right in constitutions, as well as uh, a, an indirect and recognition in terms of the right to life provisions of various constitutions. If we look globally, we see that uh, in this particular uh, slide, you'll see that there are many, many countries that include uh, a provision in their constitutions on the right to a healthy environment. And as I've said, there are two types of provisions. One is the right to life provisions, which you find in India and Pakistan, which have been interpreted in various cases as you see on the screen, but these require active judicial interpretation in order for them to be adequately recognized. But more appropriately these days, direct inclusion of a right to environment uh, should be included in constitutions. And we see around the world that over 160 countries have now incorporated some form of recognition of environmental rights. When we look at constitutional rights in Asia, we see that there are various kinds of provisions. I classify them as robust or less strong constitutional provisions, to put it kindly. And in this particular book on environmental law and human rights, we see in the Asia Pacific region uh, a range of uh, a range of provisions being included uh, in the national constitutions and I won't go into these in any detail but you'll see that in the Philippines it's slightly uh, less direct the state shall protect and advance the right of the people to a balanced and healthful ecology and this particular article was of course the basis uh, for the opposer case in 1993, but then going from, uh, from um, the, the constitution of the Republic of Korea, all citizens have a right to a healthy and pleasant environment. What does that mean? Uh, and that the substance of the environmental right is determined by law. We see a, a, a good uh, definition in Indonesia, strong one. Uh, we see a very important one, a very good one in the Timor constitution. And then we have the right to life provisions in Bangladesh, India, and, and Pakistan. I won't go into detail in, the, uh, in relation to the opposer case, except to recognize that this, this whole process of intergenerational justice that was begun by uh, an attorney opposer back in 1993 has become a worldwide phenomenon and of course uh, recognizes um, 
the idea of intergenerational uh, justice uh, in both this case as well as in subsequent cases in the Philippines. So I'll conclude with these five points. Clearly, human rights and environmental law are converging by being embedded in constitutions and in the, the interpretation of legal instruments by international, regional and national courts. Secondly, as I've said, the special rapporteur on human rights and the environment has produced a very strong report setting up state obligations. Thirdly, the UN General Assembly has over the last couple of years considered the idea of a global pact for the environment and maybe in 2022 we will see a strong international declaration which includes an explicit right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment, perhaps based on the pact or based on broader considerations. In ASEAN countries, as I've argued, it may be time to consider a regional instrument on environmental protection, on the conservation of nature and natural resources, taking into account the recognition of environmental rights found in the 2012 ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. So they are my very brief conclusions. You can see that this is a huge subject uh, and in many of the papers uh, that you will hear in the next couple of days, some of these issues will be spelled out more particularly. So thank you for your uh, attention and I wish you a wonderful conference. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Um, and uh, although we're a little bit over time, Ready, which is never a good way of starting the conference, uh, and I apologise. Um, ben, there are two questions, uh, and if you could answer them um, as briefly as possible, that would be great. Um, one is from Hannah Lim, um, who talks about how effective would a legal regime be that is not human-centred, um, but doesn't imply the right to a quality environment, but instead recognising the right of the environment to exist in its own right. Um, that's a, a question that maybe panel for another day. Um, and we also have a question from Borneo. Um, could you expand on the definition on local communities? Um, well, firstly, thank you for the questions. Uh, in relation to the recognition, really, of the rights of the environment or of nature, this is, of course, uh, an issue that has been taken up in a number of South American constitutions, particularly in Ecuador and Bolivia. Uh, and they have been the basis and will continue to be the basis uh, of legal interpretation. Uh, we see this also uh, in various other statements, regional statements. One of the questions is, how do, you, how do you defend the rights of the environment itself? Well, clearly, when we consider uh, what environmental law is and what it should do, there is already an implicit recognition. Uh, of the rights of nature. We see this now in cases to do with the recognition uh, of uh, legal personality of rivers uh, in India, in New Zealand, and in other places. So the second question, uh, Matthew, was to do with the... Defining communities. Defining communities. Ah, yes. This is a very important question. Uh, because community, communities uh, can be limited to, let's say, various ethnic groups. Uh, it can be limited to people in a particular, uh, a particular geographical area, or it could be uh, expanded to the whole of a country. Uh, it, when we think about the definitions, though, we need to think about, for example, national legislation and how uh, it applies to particular groups and communities. Uh, very often legislation does not refer to uh, individual groups uh, or specific communities, and that is therefore going to be a matter of interpretation. But clearly, when we think about communities, we can think about indigenous communities, we can think about cities, we can think about suburbs, and so forth. And we certainly had to do that uh, in consideration of the rules for example, that apply to uh, issues of COVID uh, in, in many, many countries uh, as to how far or how narrow uh, the rules might apply. 
Um, so thank you very much, Ben. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity and the time you've given for us today. And of course, the extraordinary depth of scholarship, as Georgie mentioned, um, over the many years, um, I won't say how old, but over the many years um, that you've been working on environmental law and human rights law. So thank ages, you very much. Age is just a number, Matthew. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Um, I would now like to um, introduce uh, and the um, co-host and moderator for the next session, uh, Bibo Domando uh, uh, from Greenpeace Southeast Asia. Um, and he will be moderating and leading um, the discussion on the panel talk of, of climate justice in ASEAN. And I apologize um, for already um, causing problems with the time, but thank you very much uh, and uh, good, good luck for the next session. Thank you, Ben. All right. All right, thank you for the kind introduction, Matthew, and Professor Ben for the wonderful presentation. So once again, good morning, Southeast Asian nations. Good morning, Filipinas, and wherever you are right now, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Philippines. Hello and hi, and assalamu alaikum to the hundreds of participants and viewers who are joining outside the Philippines, um, because I know you have um, different time zones and you are coming from different regions. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you again to the first day of ASEAN Environmental Law Conference, Stories and Solutions in Challenging Times. This event is organized by Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law, and we are live through Ariel's Facebook page. So I am Muhammad Ryan Biwa Dumado, and I will be your moderator in this first session of the first day of the conference. So our topic this morning is about climate justice. So as we all know, we are all experiencing the impacts of climate change. We are seeing the threats of climate change, such as, uh, and among others, um, melting glaciers, the wildfire drought. Rising sea levels are swallowing up islands. Extreme storms are devastating communities. And each year is indeed increasingly going hotter and hotter. Our life is indeed at risk. Our house is indeed on fire. We are in a climate emergency. That is why the concept of climate justice was given birth. People are demanding climate justice to the government to create policies and enact and enforce climate laws. People are seeking climate justice to the major contributors of climate change who has been emitting carbon in the environment through many decades. So today, we will talk more about climate justice and we are honored to be joined by three empowered women lawyers in the panel. They are attorney Briani Ilef, attorney Jin Mei Lu, and attorney Hasmina Paudaktawano. At this very juncture, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Attorney Briani Ilef is a climate change and environmental lawyer working in the Asian Development Bank's law and policy reform program. She spent the last few years leading detailed research into climate change law, policy, and litigation in Asia and the Pacific. ADB published the results as a four-part report series, Climate Change, Coming Soon to a Court Near You. The report discussed climate science, Asian and the Pacific uh, climate litigation, and regional and international climate law and policy in her work with ADB. Ms. Il Ilef also supports, South, um, supports the Southeast Asia government with its climate law and climate change strategy update. So ladies and gentlemen, let us uh, give a warm welcome to attorney Briani Ilef. Good morning, attorney Briani. Good morning. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, you make my job easier in talking about uh, what I've been doing. Let me share my screen. Forgive me for my technical challenges. <laughs> okay. So I hope that you can see the presentation, wonderful. Okay, so as uh, Bibo mentioned, I work in a team at ADB that has been working with uh, judges for the last decade on environmental and climate change law. And around 2015, 2016, with the Paris Agreement adoption, we realized that it was important to start talking about climate change law, but also to be talking about climate change law uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, at the time, there was not a, not a lot of information about climate change litigation specifically in Asia. Uh, and we wanted to be able to 
acknowledge the hard work done by some of the phenomenal judges in the region uh, and to be able to write about their seminal jurisprudence and to share it. We also wanted to create a one-stop shop for judges and lawyers working on climate change and environmental law. We acknowledge that this is an area that can be really challenging for lawyers and judges. It's hard in a region that needs so much development to be the one who puts up your hand and says, uh, what about rights? What about the environment, uh, constitutional rights? And for judges that can be isolating and also for lawyers and you can be labeled anti-development and as we've heard from the Philippines, have your life threatened. So we designed these reports as a one-stop shop. There's four reports in our series and I'm sorry about all the branding. I'm just gonna show you what the reports are and talk about them and give you the links to where you can go to, to, to access them. They can be downloaded from, for free from the Asian Development website. Okay, so moving to report one. Uh, so you can see that I've got two key points for this report. Uh, firstly, we wanted to talk about the purpose. Why are we doing this? Why are we sharing Asian, Asian litigation, uh, Asian law and litigation? And it's because at the time there was a lot of uh, written information about litigation in climate litigation in the US, Australia, Europe, um, and those jurisdictions are the leading jurisdictions in terms of volume of cases and laws. And so they're, they're really useful, but we wanted to understand what defined the Asian voice. Um, and we also, knowing that Asia also has some excellent uh, environmental jurisprudence, we wanted to understand what is the intersection between that jurisprudence and climate litigation and are there cases that don't even mention climate litigation or climate law but have co-benefits for in, uh, for climate change and secondly we looked at an introduction to climate science now uh, we had a conference with judges back in 2016 and it emerged that many judges and lawyers feel uncomfortable talking about this phenomena and at the time the, the media reports were actually quite split. You know, you'd have climate denial in one media report and another one talking about it being a real phenomena and it could be really confusing. Also the IPCC reports are wonderful resources. They're also very long and can be very confusing. So uh, that was one of the purposes is to really talk about climate change. Now I'm not a climate scientist. I don't profess to be and this was terrifying to write this report, however, as I said, it's, it's part of our practice. We need to understand, you know, what's causing it? Um, what are the outcomes? What can we do about it? And, I, and one of the some key points that I just wanted to highlight from this report is that uh, climate science is not controversial. 97% uh, of those climate scientists who actively publish agree that it's real, it's being caused by human emissions of greenhouse gases. And if we look over the planet's climate history, you've, I've given you a graph here for the last 800 years. Indeed, scientists can track, to, track this back 3 million years. You can see a very clear pattern of Earth cycling between um, glacial periods and warmer periods like we have now. And never in the course of the last 800,000 years or even earlier have, green, have carbon dioxide levels been that high. So that was a really key takeaway for this report. I'll move to the second report um, and looking at climate litigation. So as I said, we, we really wanted to focus on climate litigation. Now, coming into the report series, there was so much excellent work uh, defining what this emerging body of law is. And it did a great job of creating, um, you know, a definition around it. But we wanted to know well, does that suit for Asia? And, and we felt that for Asia, it was really important to look at these first elements, should be a case that raises climate change as an issue, it could be a peripheral issue. But thirdly, we wanted to talk about those cases that are not directly relevant to climate change, but contain important principles for mitigation and adaptation. Adaptation is an important term. For the most part in Asia, that is what countries are concerned about. So we need to look at those cases that protect 
biodiversity and protect ecosystems because those actions protecting forests have benefits for climate change. And so we incorporated that body of work into our climate, into our report. Another example is our cases from Bangladesh that protect floodplains. Dhaka is one of the world's most vulnerable cities to flooding. And so that makes it an important issue in the 21st century. So look, when we're looking at a climate change case. So when we looked at the cases, uh, rather than uh, providing country summaries of cases, what we did is we looked at the cases thematically that allowed us to cherry pick outstanding jurisprudence across the region. And we look at types of cases, so cases holding governments accountable, cases challenging permitting and uh, decisions like EIAs or judicial review, cases against private parties. This is a growing area of law. In the 21st century, it's identified as a key risk for anyone doing business. So it's important to look at the growing number of cases in that field. Adaptation, as we said, we really wanted to capture the what it is about um, Asian jurisprudence that's important and adaptation is really important to focus on for this region. Fifthly, we have a section on people who are vulnerable to climate change. Climate change disproportionately affects women, children, indigenous peoples, older citizens, uh, and other minority groups and people with disabilities. We need to start talking about what litigation looks like when we're involving those kinds of parties what rights should we be looking at? What are their rights of participation? And then the last point is on transboundary litigation. Because this is about Asia and the Pacific and many countries have not caused climate change, we get asked a lot about transboundary litigation. It's not that big, honestly, in climate change, but it's useful to cover. Uh, we were really excited to cover with the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law in drafting these reports. They co-authored report two and also report three, the next report. And what that allowed us to do is for each of these sections, we have a section on Asian and Pacific approaches, approaches and contrast it with approaches elsewhere in the world. That allows us to do two things. One, show what the Asian voice is, but to share, share ideas. Asian judges have ideas that are worth listening to, as do their lawyers. And, and we also need to share information with judges and lawyers from elsewhere in the world and see how they approach these issues. Okay, so let's move to report three. Report three is about the, um, oh, my notes. Uh, report three is about the national legal climate change frameworks. And our challenge with this report was, how do we make it useful, relevant, relevant, and not so dry that it's boring. Um, so what we did is we looked at some trends in, uh, in climate laws in Asia and the Pacific. So this report specifically looks at Asia and the Pacific. And what we found in the trends are some interesting things like only 25% of the countries have a framework climate change law. Now, what a framework law can do is set up your institutions and make it very clear who is responsible for doing what. It can set targets, but what it also does is it can do things like allow for sharing of data and information. We will only attack climate change or minimize it rather if we work together. We need to share. So that's the benefit of a framework law. The other 75% of the countries in the region um, use of existing laws and policies and that you know that allows them to release policies that are quickly and rely on existing existing laws but what it does make it difficult to do is to understand the holistic picture of how a country is regulating climate change and that's what that third point the national legal and policy frameworks is about because climate change affects every sector so what we did is we said okay how is this country regulating energy? How is it regulating forestry or agriculture? So these are not just 
summaries of laws. It's more of an analysis of how each type of sector is being regulated. And then secondly, you see that point constitutional legal frameworks. Uh, Professor Ben has made it very clear already about the use of rights in litigation. So around 35% of global uh, climate litigation is rights-based and the leading litigation in Asia and the Pacific is rights-based. So, um, and, and they rely on constitutional rights. So what we did is created some tables looking at what rights are relevant to climate change or impacted by climate change. It just makes it easier as a practitioner for you to say, wow, India has a similar um, constitutional right to us. Maybe we can apply that in our context. Uh, and then fourthly, the last report you, you, we, is about international legal frameworks. Of course, we need to talk about the architect architecture in, in one place. So the UNFCCC, um, the Kyoto Protocol, and also the Paris Agreement, which is it's the agreement, the pinnacle at the moment for regulating international responses. Uh, because we recognize that there are other ways of impacting or having benefits for climate change, we look at multilateral environment legal instruments, and we also look at some of the regional environment, environmental climate change instruments. And then that first fourth point on rights-based instruments. We talk about the procedural international and environmental climate change dimensions. And that is there's often a notion that it's challenging for, for lawyers or judges to incorporate international legal principles into domestic laws or domestic frameworks. And so I have a very talented colleague who looked at some of the leading jurisprudence in the region of courts doing exactly that, taking international principles and applying them in the context of legal rights in a national framework. So I think some of the key takeaways for this report series and just, um, just wanna, yeah, I'll run through them. Um, national, so we have this international legal framework and it would be really tempting to think that's what we need to do, focus on the international legal framework to make climate change happen. But the reality is that we can only solve climate change in our own backyard often. So we need that national level action. And it shows that national climate laws and policies are the backbone of domestic climate action because they regulate the marketplace. And, and it also shows you how important then that litigation and courts can be because courts interpret enable and uphold laws. And that makes climate litigation and legal decisions a force for pushing for better climate action. And um, just, yeah, the, the final point is Asia really has shining examples of rights-based climate litigation. So please do check out our report series. Um, as I said, you can download them from this web address. So. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much uh, for your insightful report, Attorney Brioni. All right, so for the attendees, if you have questions, you can raise that through our Q&A box and re we will relay that to our dear panelists later. So our next speaker will talk about climate justice initiatives. And joining the panel is Attorney Jinmei Liu. Attorney Jinmei Liu is... Jin, uh, Attorney Jinmei Liu has started working as a Mekong Legal Coordinator. Uh, sorry, sorry. Legal Coordinator of Mekong Legal Program of Earth Rights International since 2015, focusing on Chinese overseas investment in Mekong region countries and South American. Before joining Earthright, Jin Mei worked as an environmental public interest lawyer representing pollution victims from communities across China. She is a graduate of the China University of Political Science and Law, and after completion of her studies, Jin Mei joined the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Victims in Beijing as a full-time volunteer lawyer. 
put, putting into practice her dual interest in environmental law, practice, and public interest law. She has a rich experience in conducting environmental tort litigation, environmental public interest litigation, and administrative litigation in China, as well as in supporting environmental NGOs and communities to build their legal capacity. So here is Attorney Jin Mei Liu. Good morning, Attorney Jin Mei. Thank you for the introduction, Bibo. Can you see my presentation? Yes, you can see it. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jin Mei, a Chinese environment lawyer, and currently I'm the General Counsel of Friends of Nature. So today's presentation, I will mainly focus on the, um, some of the climate litigation cases happened in China. And all my cases um, will come from an NGO's perspective. Before I started to introduce um, the cases, a very brief introduction about Friends of Nature. So Friends of Nature has established in 1993 and it's China's first national-wide grassroots environment NGO. We have more than 13,000 um, volunteers across the country. Um, from 2011 till now, Friends of Nature has filed 49 public interest litigations. And all of these uh, public interest litigations has crossed and covered mainly all the um, main challenges of environment issues and climate issues. Some of these has goes to the traditional um, industry pollution and some goes to the marine protection. And 10 of these cases goes to the biodiversity protection and two of them are goes to the um, climate litigation. So I will introduce some more um, cases, uh, more details later on. This meaning is a map to shows um, all of these public interest litigation has filed by Friends of Nature goes to across the China. So the first thing I want to introduce today is the, um, the current climate litigations happening in China. And the second part, I will give a brief introduction about the main, main challenges the NGOs are facing when we are filing these climate litigation cases. So who are the legal bodies who can fire the climate litigations in China at this stage? So the first group goes to the NGOs, I mean the domestic NGOs. So domestic Chinese NGOs can file the public interest litigation and only in the public interest litigation, which means the NGOs can bring the cases to target the enterprise's behavior on behalf of the public interest, which means the NGOs at this stage cannot file the case against the Chinese government on behalf of the public interest. We only can sue the enterprises and sue the companies if their behavior has broken the law or bring the damage to the public interest. And these are the main climate related litigations at this stage. And the second type of the legal bodies goes to the prosecutors or the procurators. The, pro the prosecutors can also bring the public entry litigation at this stage. And different from the NGOs for the prosecutors, they can bring the cases to target the enterprise's behavior on behalf of the public interest, but they also can bring the cases to target the government concrete administrative decisions on behalf of the public interest, which means the prosecutors can sue the companies and also can sue the government at this stage. But related to the climate litigations at this stage, I believe the prosecutors didn't bring any case yet. So the third type is goes to the climate victims, which meaning goes to the individuals or the business. And they can bring the private tort litigation and they can target the enterprise's behavior for their own interest, not for the public interest, but for their own interest. They could also sue the government if the government's concrete administration decisions has broken the law or all bring the damage to their own interest. But related to the climate litigation, I believe at this stage, there's no climate victims has brought any case to the court yet in China. So 
my introduction will mainly goes to the cases has been brought by the NGOs. At this stage, in the broader meaning, the cases related to the climate allegations goes to mainly these four types. For the first type, mainly goes to the clean air related issues. So some of the citizens or the Chinese NGOs have brought the cases such as to sue or against the coal power plant. So when the citizens or the Chinese NGOs believe this coal power plant has, brought, has broken the law and also bring the damage to the public interest or their own interest, then they will file the cases and to sue this coal power plant. This is the first type. And this, most of these cases goes to this type of the case. And the second type is actually kind of still new type of the case is the Chinese NGOs has brought some of the cases to against some of the vehicle or vessel companies, all the owners of the vehicles or the vessels. When I say owners, I don't mean the, the, the person or the individuals who drive the car or own the car. I mean some of the big logistic company or the e-commercial companies who owns thousands of the vehicles all the heavy duty vehicles or trucks and many of their vehicles has been brought in the law and um, bring the damage to the public interest. So this type of the case goes to the mobile source is the second type of case and Jews are targeting at this stage related to the climate litigation. And the third type is directly goes to the climate issues is renewable energy. So I think many of you, if you pay attention on the Chinese policy that the president has announced a very ambitious goal last year that um, China will go trying to achieve the um, goals and the target in 2016 about the carbon mutual. And of course, the energy structure and energy mapping energy policy is uh, very important and the uh, main focus of this uh, mapping. And so the third type is uh, the case has been filed by Friends of Nature. Is we're suing some of these energy companies and some of these electricity companies. And I will give more details later. And the last type is a very new type of the case. It goes to the circular economic. Actually, China has issued the circular economic law years ago, but this law has been sleeping for a very long time. And the last year, one of the Chinese NGO has brought the case to sue one of the real estate company because of the company has brought, broken the uh, circular economic law. So a little bit more details of these four types of the cases. For the first type of the case, so at this stage, may, most of the coal power plant will release their um, discharging data online so the NGOs can access to the information and their online data, um, the, their monitoring data from the online platform. So when we see these companies um, breaking the law from their monitoring data, then the NGOs can bring some of the cases to the copar plant. So this is mainly goes to the first type of the case. Um, but the problem of this type of case is sometimes it's difficult to figure out how effective these open data and um, how real is this open data. So this open data is very important for the NGO and also for the government's um, law enforcement movement. And the second type is uh, Friends of Nature has filed uh, the case to, against one of the South Korea um, vehicle company, which is called Honda Motor, I think. You could see this type of car on the street uh, very often. And this is the first case Friends of Nature has brought to the vehicle companies. And after this case, Friends of Nature has brought a series of the keys to against uh, Chinese domestic vehicle companies and also the, um, some of the very big and famous taxi companies and also some of these huge logistic companies. And the, um, some of the highlights of this type of company is um, some of the new cars produced by this vehicle company, all the, some of the using cars are owned by these huge taxi companies 
are obviously many of these cars are breaking, keeping breaking the law. So Friends of Nature brought the case to ask these vehicle companies to pay the compensation of the damage of the public interest. But more important is to stop the illegal behaving and also to change their behavior, such as set up the, their own company's um, system and management mechanisms to reduce these type of risks and these type of the illegal behaviors. And in many of these, these cases, we're not only simply ask them to pay the compensation because we believe that we are not solve the problem. We are trying to more use some more creative um, mechanisms to let these companies to um, take their liability. In the Hyundai case, Friends of Nature, um, together with, of course, the support from the court, set up a charitable trust. So the all the compensation money can go to the, these charitable trusts. And in some of other cases, we ask the defendant to install the charging piles of the electric vehicles in some urban areas. So more people, more owners who are driving the electric vehicle cars can easily find the charging piles. And in another case, we ask the defendant to donate electric special function vans um, to the local government. And the third case is um, officially being called the China's first climate litigation also filed by Friends of Nature to suing the Gansu state agreed. So China was trying to issue the uh, energy law last year. And from what we see about the open version of the um, draft of the energy law, that the principle is quite clear is the government will um, priority, put the priority to support and develop the, um, the renewable energy but the consumption of the renewable energy is always a main challenge we're facing here. And the state grid basically is the buyer of the electricity has been issued by the wind and solar farm here. So the wind and solar electricity produced by these renewable companies has not been 100% purchased by the state grid, which means the state grid didn't 100% buy the electricity from this wind and solar farm. So many of this electricity issued and generated by this renewable energy company has been wasted, we call it. And in this case, so Friends of Nature has filed a case based on the renewable energy law and requested the Gansu state grid to 100% purchase electricity generated by the um, local um, solar and wind farms. So this case is still going on and it's still in the trial process since this is the first case um, officially, I mean, the climate litigation cases here. And at this stage, China doesn't have a climate, a climate change law or um, at this stage. So there's a lot of challenges um, when we brought this case. But um, the good thing, the good side of this case is after Friends of Nature has filed this case, the case caused a great attention uh, from the National Energy Administration and NDRC and the central government. So a series of the policy on renewable energy consumption has been issued after the case has been filed. And the consumption of the renewable energy issues are being staying uh, by the central government and is also in the process of solving. And we hope this series of the cases could um, help the central government and also the renewable energy market to solve the consumption issue and also supporting their development. And the last case is uh, very interesting and it's brand new. So an NGO called ACEF, which is also a Chinese uh, local NGO, have sued a real estate developer in Shanghai city. And according uh, to the civil code, has been brand newly issued last year. And the article nine of the civil code is we call it the green principle. So according to the civil code, um, all the civil activities and all the civil legal relationships and all the parties and private um, individuals or the business, everybody in their behaving and in their activity 
should follow the green principle, which means cause less damage and less influence of the environment. And at the same time, um, ACEF also um, bring the case under the um, circular economic law. So making the um, enforcement of the circular economic law. In these cases, um, when we trying to rent, when many of these companies are trying to rent office there, you always see there's a standard a term in the um, agreement that ask you to clean all the constructions uh, of the office before you finish your tense uh, agreement. So ACEF believe this kind of term, standard term put in this type of the lease agreement is a, is a very much waste and it's caused a lot of construction waste and it's also bring a lot of the carbon uh, release. So they request the real estate company remove this standard term from all these type of the rent agreement and do not ask all the companies who rent the office have to restore the office to the um, original condition um, because almost all the office seems looks is that isn't that much different. So you don't have to always restore to the original condition and cause a lot of construction waste. So that's the um, last step of the case. Very brief to introduce what's the main challenges our NGO are facing when we bring these type of the cases. The first of the main challenge is goes to lack of the data on the um, carbon emission. Um, but um, MEE has issued um, two regulation on the um, last day of the 2020 and two of these uh, regulation will set up the main mechanisms of China's national levels um, carbon trade market. So I believe um, when the national levels carbon trade market has been set up in 2021, um, more and more data related to the carbon emission will be released and this will help the public to more participate in the climate issues. And the second is a lack of the legal basis of the linkage of carbon and public interest. Because at this stage, China doesn't have a public, uh, have a climate change law yet. And mainly all of these cases we have filed mainly under the um, tort law. So um, sometimes it's hard to prove that how these legal behaviors and um, what's the linkage between these um, behaving with the public interest, how these illegal behaving damage the public interest. So that's a, always a challenge for the lawyers at this stage. And third challenge here is it's still difficult to get the jurisdiction to accept the indirect causality between the carbon emission and the public interest damages and risks. I mean, um, China has set up uh, hundreds of the uh, special court, um, the environmental special court at this stage. And the whole jurisdictions, especially from the Supreme People's Court, are pretty open and creative um, on the most of the environment public entry litigation cases. But I believe the climate litigation is not only in China, but across the world is still challenging the tradition jurisdiction. So, I mean, in China, still in the early stage to trying to convince more of the judges to accept that the climate litigation is quite different from the traditional environment litigation. The climate justice is also different from the environment uh, justice, I mean, from the legal technical perspective. So we need, the lawyers need to spend more time to trying to convince the judges to accept the um, science uncertainty, indirect causality, and etc. The last point is, at this stage, an NGO still doesn't have a legal standing to sue the government on behalf of the public interest. So the data, yeah, um, at this stage, most of the company doesn't have the obli obligation to collect uh, the data related to the carbon release. But I believe, like I said, um, when the national level's carbon treat um, market has been set up, uh, more and more company may, maybe will have more um, uh, interest and um, 
motivations to release their data related to the uh, carbon emission. And the, at this stage, the data, the carbon uh, data from the company and the government is not open and it's not their legal obligation. And many of these companies are lack of capacity also to calculate the carbon emission of its supply chain. Um, about the legal basis, yeah, no domestic law and the mainly legal basis we're using at this stage is the civil code and also the air pollution control law and of course renewable energy law, etc. But the liability of the emissions is lack of legal basis uh, when it comes to the reduce, redu reduction and the, uh, adaption, especially when it goes to the adaption is quite a challenge when we are trying to bring the climate uh, adaption cases. And indirect causality, yeah, the, the, cause, the causal chain at this stage is really under most of the climate litigation cases is too long to prove and it's too difficult to convince the judges to believe. And the lack of data and evidence is of course is also quite a challenge and um, to con convince the judges. But I believe um, it's a great, I mean, the um, last of the guests from ADB has introduced the amazing report um, published by the ADB and uh, the Chinese lawyers and judges also quite excited to see the series of the report published by the ADB. Um, I hope one day it can be translated into Chinese and other Athenian languages. I think it will be very helpful to the lawyers to help the lawyers and the judges to have better understanding to see the climate litigations developing in ASEAN and Asian countries. And it will help the judges to build their um, capacity. And legal settings at this stage, uh, NGO cannot file the uh, cases to against the state and also local government on behalf of the public interest. But um, the whole public interest litigation mechanism is still a brand new um, mechanism in China, it's been, it's only five years um, from the beginning. So we believe in the future, there will be some development and maybe one day the NGO can also bring the cases to sue the um, government. Then we could really implement the state obligations under the um, Paris Agreement and other um, climate treaties. And the last one is the business liability. At this stage, it's um, under the domestic legal system, it's not very clear what's the business uh, reduction of the um, carbon emissions and the energy laws still on the drafting and we hope the official version of the energy law will set up some of the liability of the business on the climate change adoption and reduction so um, that's mainly the things are shared from my side i mean still a very early stage in china that for NGOs and for prosecutors and um, to bring the climate related litigation cases. And, um, but uh, we hope in the future there will be more uh, development and really looking forward to share and also um, discuss these related issues with the um, friends from the um, other Asian countries. And if there's any question, I'm really happy to answer. And that's all from me. All right, Fei Chang Gangxini, Attorney Jinnay. Madam, thank you, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. So let us move to our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker is Attorney Asmina Paudak Tawano. Attorney Asmina has been practicing law for more than a decade and runs a free legal aid clinic. From her law firm background on general litigation, she came to Greenpeace Southeast Asia Philippines as its legal advisor and currently leads the Philippine legal team's calamity justice and liability. Specifically working with various stakeholders and employing creative strategies to mainstream climate justice in the consciousness of Filipinos and institutionalize it in the government system. She finished her law studies at San Beda University and Master in Development Management at the Asian Institute of Management. The ladies and gentlemen, here is attorney Hasmina Paudak Tawano. Attorney. Thank you for that kind introduction, Bibo. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Matthew and Paul of the Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law Area for inviting me and for this opportunity to share with you our work in the Philippines. I am Hasmina D. Paudak Tawano, Legal Advisor for Climate Justice and Liability Campaign of Greenpeace Southeast Asia Philippines. For this morning, I was tasked to tell you our climate justice story, as some might not be aware or familiar of our journey. But before going to the main presentation, let me share with you this short video. In the Philippines, we lost more than 10,000 people in two hours. The waters are rising and warming. We are catching less fish. Have you heard stories like these? The Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change. Since the Industrial Revolution began 200 years ago, gases like carbon dioxide and methane have been slowly building up and warming the planet. They are the products of industrial human activities like deforestation, agriculture, and most of all, the burning of fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal. Today, we need to ask ourselves, what can we do about it? In 2015, a group of brave Filipinos took the lead and filed a landmark petition with the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines to claim their right to a stable climate. Because of their petition, groundbreaking public hearings are happening in the Philippines, New York, and London this year. 47 big companies, including Shell, Exxon, BP, and others are being investigated. They have been invited to face communities, but none of them have showed up so far. We need to hold them accountable because the outcome of this case can spark hope to vulnerable communities everywhere and give them strength to take action. It will not only benefit the Filipino people, but all of us. Must we wait to lose another loved one? Must we wait for bigger and stronger storms? Must we wait for another tragic story until we reach climate justice? This is our climate story. So what is climate justice? In a nutshell, it is seeking accountability from those who largely contributed to fueling the climate crisis and forced the rapid and just phase out of fossil fuels. Did you know that more than 69.8% of global anthropogenic or human-induced carbon emissions were significantly caused just by 90 entities since 1751 to 2017. Yes, this was based on Richard Heaty's breakthrough research, the Carbon Major Study. 50 of the 90 entities were investor owned and were responsible for 21.4% of all anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. Thus, we, Greenpeace Philippines, along with 30 nonprofit organizations and 18 bold individuals, that is a total of 32 petitioners filed the legal action against these investor-owned carbon polluting corporations such as Shell, Chevron, Exxon, and Total. But due to corporate mergers and acquisitions, the number of respondents was reduced to 47. Now, a favorite narrative that was utilized and echoed by these carbon polluters is that everyone is responsible for the effects of climate change. Thus, no one can be held accountable. This view, however, failed to consider the responsibilities and obligations of those who have contributed most to this climate crisis and profited from it. 
In addition to scientific developments, there is now extensive research into fossil fuel industries awareness, knowledge, action or inaction on climate change that helps to further establish corporate responsibility for the climate crisis. Today, Filipinos are dealing with a human rights crisis that the fossil fuel industry could have prevented. But instead of sounding the alarm, many of the respondents went out of their way to becloud the emerging scientific consensus and further delay climate action. If this is not unlawful behavior, then we need to redefine the concepts of accountability and justice. The petition invoked the honorable commissions or commission on human rights investigatory, recommendatory and monitoring powers to prevent or curb further violations of petitioners and all Filipinos constitutionally protected human rights resulting from the impacts of climate change. So these are some of the reliefs or prayers asked by the petitioners. I will not discuss everything, but mainly the petitioners hope that the Commission on Human Rights will issue a finding on the responsibility of the respondent carbon majors for human rights harms resulting from the effects of climate change in the Philippines. Now, if you'd notice from the animated video earlier, the journey started five years ago. What is unique about this petition? This is the first ever climate change related complaint submitted to and accepted by a national human rights institution. The proceedings were completed and we are just awaiting the issuance of the resolution or the final report um, by the Commission on Human Rights. This is also the first legal action to implicate a huge number of private actors 47 multinational and big coal, oil, gas, and cement companies like Shell, Exxon, Chevron, BP, and Total. This is also the first human rights body to have conducted public inquiry and consultation hearings, not only in the Philippines, but also in New York, London, and Amsterdam, to be closer to the hubs of some of the carbon majors, giving them an opportunity to participate. Thus, this somehow turned the national investigation into a global inquiry. From March 2018 to December 2018, 12 public hearings were conducted, 78 witnesses and resource persons were presented, and at least 239 documents were marked as exhibits. So what are our key takeaways from this journey? First, that courts are not the only venue for climate litigation or action. National human rights institutions prove to be an important venue and an ideal mechanism since climate change is a global issue. It has no boundaries and a human rights institution is not as rigid and technical like courts. Also, filing a case before a human rights institution will give you a platform to inform all stakeholders and duty bearers since there will be a global conversation on the issue. Cases can and can be brought forward against private actors not only on the basis of loss and damage or financial liability. To be more strategic, it must be something that will go beyond that and will create systemic changes. Also, strategic alliances with like-minded groups and individuals nationally and internationally are beneficial. On a national level, before filing the petition, we saw to it that all the other nonprofit organizations, humanitarian and environmental organizations are on board. Together, there were 14 organizations. We looked into communities as well, and hence at least 18 individuals came forward. Also, before filing the petition, we obtained the support of various international and well-respected institutions to support our petition. And to strengthen our case and give more credibility, Amicus Curie's submission from well-respected international organizations also proved helpful. In our case, there were 13 legal and scientific expert submissions in the form of Amicus Curie and letters of support. We also found out that storytelling and campaigning are powerful tools to elevate the discourse and change the narrative. We complemented our action with online and offline campaigning. We launched an online signature campaign for our petition to increase awareness. We also did art activism using arts and activism like storytelling, mural painting, film fest, etc. Through human library, we showcase climate-related stories of individuals highlighting the struggles and injustices they suffered. Political work 
supplements the legal case. We acknowledge that the limitations on the power of the Commission on Human Rights. Hence, we worked with local government units to have climate justice consciousness. We were able to get at least five resolutions from different cities or municipalities in the main three island groups of the country supporting our costs and the national income. We also found out that community work is equally important to change mindsets and behavior. Irrespective of the outcome, we want to have changes on the ground. Hence, we actively engage with communities while maintaining the legal action. Now, this case can be replicated by looking into your national human rights institutions and other government agencies with similar investigatory mandates. Of course, it always depends on the social, political, and legal context. The point is, just don't narrow your venue to courts. Be creative to find other tribunals. Don't forget to employ some or combinations of tactics we've done in our case. Now, you might be asking, what are the recent developments? So last year in, 20, in, uh, in um, September 2019, Two years ago, the final memorandum on this legal action was actually filed, and as mentioned, to this day, we are waiting for the final report that the Commission on Human Rights will issue. So what are the preliminary findings? I will not discuss everything, but here are some of the major points that were shared by the Commission in different public events, specifically uh, in December 2019 during the COP25 in Madrid, last year of July 29 in a public webinar co-organized by the Commission and a podcast shared in Rappler, a social news media site, that, and the Commission stopped before the UNBHR. Now here are some of the preliminary findings, which might be might prove useful um, for other lawyers, practitioners, or even NGOs and private individuals who wanted to lodge their climate justice case or climate change case. First, carbon majors companies played a clear role in anthropogenic climate change and its attendant impacts. The carbon majors also have an obligation to respect human rights as set out under the UN guiding principles, which are derived from international human rights law and which form a basis in establishing standards of behavior for businesses. The commission has taken note that the draft UN treaty on business and human rights, if adopted, would require signatory states to produce laws providing people harmed by climate change access to justice and remedy, and failure to pass such laws would be a violation of states' human rights obligation. Climate change is not only a human rights and existential issue, but also a justice and business issues. Justice issue because the communities or individuals who contribute less to the happening of climate change are the most impacted, like the Philippines. It is also a business issue, according to the commission, because big multinational corporations have large contributions to fueling climate change and they have an obligation to do their part in mitigating the crisis. Also, the Commission found that while international human rights law provides the appropriate standards, the Commission concluded that cases can and should be brought in domestic courts under national laws where existing laws are not adequate. The Commission recommended that governments have an obligation to adopt legislation to ensure access to justice for affected communities. The Commission also emphasized that carbon majors have an obligation to help lead transition towards clean energy and willful acts to obstruct or obfuscate science and or derail or delay global transition towards clean or renewable energy may be basis for legal liability, which liability must be established before domestic courts or local courts and which can be informed by international human rights law. And also other basis to hold them liable may also include violation of fiduciary duty towards shareholders, fraud against investors, civil liability under tort. The Commission further added that these carbon majors have responsibility to, to conduct climate change and human rights impacts assessments other than the environmental impacts assessments that we already have and reveal these not only to regulatory agencies but also to governments in general. The Commission also recommends that states should stop providing incentives and tax breaks to activities that are related to fossil fuel extraction. Instead, incentives should be given to activities or efforts towards renewables or clean energy production. And also the Commission state stated that states should further promote and enforce the principle of transparency require corporations to be more transparent in terms of their carbon footprint, like 
how much are they investing on renewables and on fossil fuels. Now, the greatest challenge now to the global community is to wean itself away from dirty fossil fuel to renewable energy and all efforts to derail or obstruct these efforts is immoral, if not illegal, according to the Commission. The Commission is in favor of the development of an international treaty on business and human rights because it recognizes that some corporations are too strong such that they operate in virtual impunity. And if there is no international treaty that will hold them accountable, then they'll be virtually not held accountable because of the weak power of certain states where they operate. And if that happens, our climate will continue to be endangered. Finally, the commission encourages civil society organizations to continue to explore evidence-based theories in litigation, to continue to develop global jurisdiction through strategic litigation that will hasten the movement of global economy towards decarbonization. With this legal action, not only were the voices of the communities heard, but the commission responded to some of their pleas, specifically when it launched its climate Justice Observatory last September, creating a repository of evidence that would be a very useful resource for the public in building their climate case, launching a new one, or just simply wanting to learn more on the cross-cutting issues of climate change and human rights. Now, here are some of the relevant links that will be useful should you want to know more about the national inquiry. So what can be gathered from our legal action or climate justice story? Four words. It can be done. There's no such thing as David versus Goliath if you are fighting for a good cause. And there's no better cause than the cause for the environment and human rights. You can't advocate for human rights without learning the basic right to life. That is, according to a renowned Philippine constitutionalist, to live a good life. One of the rudiments of living a good life is having a stable climate and a helpful and balanced ecology where human rights are respected. That's all. Thank you for listening. Should you have questions, let's have a conversation later. So thank you, um, Attorney Hasmina, for that wonderful presentation. So moving on, we are now in the Q&A, our questions and answers session. So I'm calling back Attorney uh, Brioni and Attorney Jinmei in the panel. Um, so here is the first question. Um, so with all, uh, first question um, is addressed to everyone. Um, with all the societal issues brought by climate change, um, does mitigation and adaptation is still relevant in the future of humanity? So I think we can start uh, uh, to Attorney Brioni. Yeah, sure. I, I think there is certainly a role for adaptation and mitigation. Really all it means is reducing mitigation means reducing or drawing down the greenhouse gas emissions to stabilize the climate and adaptation means ensuring that our ecosystems or our urban centers are resilient and can adapt so unless we do those two things we can't protect human rights and we should be clear that we are on a path for um, at least 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial temperatures and that is not safe for everyone on this planet particularly the people in the pacific so uh yes those are critical aspects of protecting human rights and they need to be done and there is still a place all right um attorney jinmi um if uh does mitigation and adaptation is still relevant in the future of humanity So while we are uh, waiting for a third, I, right, all right. You can proceed, attorney. Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to type in the, the, the answers for the questions. Um, so which one I should go now, sorry. So the question is, with all the societal issues brought by climate change, uh, does mitigation and adaptation still relevant in the future of humanity? All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, Yes, um, from my own perspective, I think, yes, um, it's totally relevant. And um, 
um, I mean, we are putting uh, lots of efforts on it. And I think the, uh, from the China side, at least, um, the Chinese government also has made a, a very ambitious and a big commitment on this. And uh, many of these local governments are really putting the policies on the adoptions after um, 2020's huge uh, flood in the whole summer and which caused a lot of the um, losses and damages to the public property. And uh, um, so I think um, the China's 14th uh, five-year plan is coming uh, very soon in a few months. I think um, this year there will be some special plan um, just for the climate change um, and also for the whole energy uh, structure and policy. Um, I think at least from Friends of Nature, we will pay great attention to that um, one and we'll see how the um, Chinese government is one of the biggest uh, um, contributor that um, how the Chinese policy will um, react and uh, also will um, contribute to this one. Thank you. All right, thank you. Attorney Asmina. Thank you for that question, Bibo. I think my simple answer, yes, it is a very relevant adaptation and mitigation. But more than that, I think the government should really focus on the enforcement aspect. We have a lot of laws, plenty of laws. Unfortunately, these laws were not really enforced. And some um, and also other than the government responsibility, I wanted to actually really um focus also on the responsibility of corporations or businesses and also uh, because they are, according to uh, a lot of studies, uh, one of the significant contributors of this climate crisis. So sh they should uh, have that significant role and play, uh, uh, play their main role, fair share in um, doing this um, efforts, this mitigation or adaptation efforts. Of course, I'm not saying that individuals like us will not be doing our part. So this should be a a holistic approach. Thank you, Bibo. All right. Um, so my next question is addressed to you, Attorney Asmina. Um, what is the status now of the 2015 climate justice petition to the CHR, uh, filed by Greenpeace and other petitioners, especially when it comes to the incentivization on transparency part? Sorry, I didn't get the last uh, word and, and something. What, 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 what was that? Um, especially when it comes to the incentivization and transparency part. Okay, incentivization. Okay, yes. Um, unfortunately, we are still waiting for uh, the Commission on Human Rights to issue the final report. Hopefully, um, this first quarter of the year. And regarding the incentivization and transparency part, that is one that we are hoping that our policymakers, our regulators, our government will really look into, specifically in the enforcement side, because um, we can, as a civil society or organizations, as individuals, or as a, as a lawyer myself, we can just do file these cases, but uh, at the end of the day, we are not the ones who will make these laws and who will implement these laws. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. For Attorney Jinmei, um, what are the success of the cases you have mentioned in your uh, presentation? Uh, and how much consideration is given for national development or prosperity by the judges? Attorney Jinmei. Sorry. Hi. Um... All right. I'm sorry, I didn't really get the question. I'm trying to find All oh, right, All right. All right. Uh, I can repeat the question. Um, what are the success rates of the cases um, you have mentioned in your presentation? And how much consideration is given for uh, the national development or prosperity by the judges? All right, I think I typed uh, my answer to that question in the, in the uh, question box already. So yes, um, for the 49 cases has been brought by the Friends of Nature at this stage and uh, 21, 22 of these cases has been uh, registered and accepted by the court, uh, 42 of those and 21 of these cases has been closed at this stage and Friends of Nature has won all of these cases. So, so far it's 100% won at the court and uh, 21 of these cases, which mean 15% are still going on 
um, at this stage, and we will see uh, what's the final result after the court made the decision. So I think for um, at least in the past 10 years, the whole Chinese jurisdiction system are really putting the um, public interest and the environment interest and environmental justice as the priority when they are considering these litigations uh, related to the environment challenges and issues. So all these judges, most of them are coming from the special environment court I has mentioned uh, before, and many of them are under the special um, capacity training and they really believe uh, the value and the importance of the environment justice. And they are as the group and also as the um, whole are putting a lot of efforts and their um, passion and uh, uh, expertise to trying to make the um, uh, public interest and the environment justice uh, happen. So I think um, not like 10 years ago, um, the development will be the priority for them to considering at this stage, I believe they are the same as what we are doing is trying to defend and uh, put the climate, put the public interest as a priority. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Attorney Jinmei. Uh, for you, Attorney uh, Brioni, um, there is a question here that will will Asian um, Asian Development Bank continue to fund industries that are extractive and causes climate impacts? Uh, good question. I'm a consultant, <laughs> uh, and and I'm not a member of. Um, of management, so I know this sounds like I'm passing the buck, but I, I it's really not a question that that I can answer. So, apologies for that. Right, um, I understand, uh, Attorney Brioni. So let's move on to our next question, and it is addressed to everyone. Um, the question is: What are the specific challenges you have had to overcome in the case, or more generally, in working on climate change in your country? Again, I repeat, uh, what are the specific challenges you have had to overcome in the case or more generally in working on climate change in your country? So uh, we can start with Attorney Asmina again. Um, thank you, Bibo. First, uh, our legal action is a novel one. Uh, first of all, kind of at the time tackling the responsibility of these big polluters on the interdependent issues of climate change and human rights. Also, the jurisdictional challenge. We have an important but unusual venue, the Commission on Human Rights, whose jurisdiction was repeatedly assailed by opposing parties and another challenge is filing a suit against numerous respondents. We have 47 fossil fuel and cement companies which are headquartered outside the Philippines and have business activities around the world. So, but not even the location of most big polluters prompted us to put down our sleigh, choosing the Commission on Human Rights as a venue was actually strategic as it is the best legal body to hear such an important and novel case due to its flexibility and ability to take on uh, complex matters. We were just fortunate that the Philippine Constitution is on our side mandating the, com the Commission on Human Rights to investigate all forms of human rights violations involving Filipinos wherever they may be situated. Also, um, although we struggled during the initial years as we waited for almost three years before the public hearings were commenced, we found allies in national, international climate science, legal and policy experts who helped strengthen our case and embolden the commission, which could have dismissed the case for its novelty, right? But they proceeded with the national inquiry without fear or favor. Also, um, getting community witnesses on the stand to articulate the human rights harms they personally suffered as a result of the activities of these fossil fuel companies and national experts to validate these stories of injustices and international experts to triangulate these testimonies. Um, the science and jurisprudence actually um, outweighed the seeming obstacle of having a case of first impression. What we had then was not just legal arguments to mount and surmount legal challenges of arguing something new, but the fundamental truth that no amount of corporate denial and greenwashing can refute. We had to change the narrative that big polluters could not be held morally or legally responsible for climate change and that some laws that help them operate could protect them from the consequences of their actions or inactions that infringe the basic human rights. All right, uh, thank you, Attorney Asmina. So let's move to Attorney Brioni. Uh, the specific challenges you have had to overcome in the case or more generally working on climate change in your country? 
Uh, so perhaps if I, um, I'm Australian, so I won't talk about it as Australian, perhaps I can talk about what we see in, in Asia and the Pacific and some of the, the challenges that we see. I think in, in many jurisdictions, standing is an issue in climate change litigation, particularly for um, concerned citizens or civil service organizations, CSOs or NGOs. It can be hard for them to demonstrate um, that they have a connection with the particular matter beyond being interested and concerned. And I think that's why uh, client rights-based actions have become popular across the region, particularly in South Asia, because they give litigants uh, a right to hang their case on. So they can say, I have a constitutional right to environment, a constitutional right to life and your actions or your inaction is undermining my right to life. Um, and these constitutional petitions also frequently uh, grant petitioners direct access to courts of higher jurisdiction like a Supreme Court. So that has been one of the workarounds with standing, uh, but you know, we address standing in our reports. Uh, the other thing is, is getting, um, people to connect the dots. Um, you know, over time we've seen many cases where, and Hasmina raised this about um, enforcement, many cases where small instances of clearing mangroves or forestry, forests are kind of downplayed and that's like, oh, that person was poor and, you know, it's, you know. Um, so getting people to understand that mangroves are uh, carbon capture warriors and they protect communities from sea level rise or storm surges during typhoons. That's really critical. So it's about um, trying to understand there's this international framework, yes, and we are talking about climate change, but it is happening now and you need to understand what it means for you and your particular community. So I think that's a really relevant thing, um, connecting the dots. And also right now we're going through a global pandemic. Um, we've all been sitting at home. Courts have had to transition to a virtual courtroom, which has actually presented challenges and opportunities. It presents opportunities in the sense that now you can have these virtual courtrooms and bring in global experts without having to fly them in. But it does create issues with how do you give access to justice for uh, people who don't have access to technology. So they're just some of the, the mites and the things that I'm seeing right now. All right, thank you. Um, how about you, Attorney Jinmei? The specific challenges you have got to overcome in the case in working on climate change in your country. Thank you. Um, I think uh, two uh, points goes to that one. Um, the first is um, how to calculate the damage is really often a challenge. Um, Frank Venture has filed a case to sue one of the really huge real estate company that because the damage and cost loss of the mangrove forest near the sea coast. Um, it's easy to convince the judge in that case that these mango forests really contribute to the climate change and it have a very great and the um, eco value there. But how to calculate the eco value of these mango forests become a challenge really in these cases. I mean, if you really only calculate is uh, some of the normal trees or some of the woods, then there's a very little damage. But when we try to put all the eco value and climate value on these mangrove forests, it's become a very significant challenge to the court. And the second type is um, in these renewable energy cases. I mean, the judge often asks a question is, these uh, state grid only purchase the electricity, they don't produce the pollution. So yes, because of they don't purchase, 100% purchase the in, in, renewable energy, it, maybe cause some damage to the public interest, but how big and how big the obligations these companies should take and how much they should pay to for the damage of the compensation, it's really a challenge. It's different from the tradition, the um, industry pollution cases, we can easily to calculate, okay, we need to restore this soil and we need to restore this river, clean this river, then you need to pay the enough money to clean it. But under the climate litigation cases, how we calculate the damage and how much is enough in these cases, it's become a challenge for both lawyers and also for the justices. 
Thank you. We will, right. if, sorry, if you wouldn't mind just adding to that, Jinmei, sure. in, in uh, the report series, that uh, we talk about some cases from Indonesia, uh, and they have been wonderful, wonderful jurisdiction jurisprudence on how you quantify or you calculate damages around peat fires. So similar issues in Indonesia with burning down peat fires and looking at carbon emissions, how you price that, how you uh, restore soil and how you restore the land. So we do cover those in our report and they're wonderful, a wonderful set of cases. Thank All you right. so much, um, great to know that. All right, thank you once again, Attorney Brioni, Attorney Asmina and Attorney Jim May. Uh, for the attendees, I would like to uh, raise all your questions, but it's already 12 p.m. here in the Philippines, and we are over time. But um, let's um, let's have a um, I think five minute extension uh, for the final summation or the final words of the our our panel uh, of our panelists. So let's start with Attorney Brioni. Thank you. Uh, so I I guess. Uh... One of the things that occurred to me, and there was recently an article that Justice Chief Judge Brian Preston wrote about, is a need for climate conscious lawyering. And at all levels, lawyers work in all levels of government, in private entities, in NGOs, and it's about connecting the dots and understanding this need, this consciousness for this need for climate action. The other thing that I would say to many practitioners across the region is uh, that climate change case may not be the big agenda style case where you're suing the government or the big human rights case. It might be something very small, like, in, I shouldn't say small, but an a challenge to an environmental impact assessment or permitting. Uh, one of the biggest cases that's come out of um, the region is the case of Lagari and Pakistan. And this was a farmer suing the government saying, I don't have enough water. What was wonderful about that case is in, instead of just limiting it to a discussion about, about water and saying, you know, we need to look at water permits, the court and presumably the uh, advocates involved made this a climate change issue and said water is becoming scarce and we now need this adaptation and it evolved it in, into this incredible discussion about climate justice, water justice, environmental justice and the court created a commission and it directed the government to um, make sure that it followed its policy and, and meet around 66% of what was in its policy. And that's what climate conscious lawyering is. It's about understanding that climate hides in so many sectors and it's about bringing that focus and about bringing that mindfulness into our practice. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, how about you, Attorney Jinmei? Thank you. Um, my point was, goes to, I see uh, one of our friends post a question in the chat box. He's asking, is it too late to take action at this stage? Um, it's still worse to try. I mean, I, basically that question goes to, I think um, the words really um, influenced me in 2020 is um, when we're talking about the generation justice, what we are talking here is um, it's not about um, do we still worst to trying, but it's our, this generation's obligation to take the action because we didn't inherit the land from our ancestor, but we borrowed it from our children. So when we borrowed the land from our children, we need to give the land as it as whole to our children, not a damaged land, not a broken land, but the land to, to our children. So I, from my own perspective, I always think it's worth to try. Um, after the president announced the 2016 uh, carbon mutual goal, I had a meeting with the, one of the judges who are trying in the case we sue the state grid. State grid is really a, a powerful company. It's like a giant company. And um, in that meeting, our judge finally, after three years said, um, Oh, I just learned the policy about the 2016 carbon mutual. I think in this case, we have to considering about the climate justice. I think that's the moment for the lawyers feels like every effort is worth it. 
So um, yeah, it's never too late to take the action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Attorney Smina. Um, I think with the preliminary statements of the commission that I already shared earlier, it is safe to say that the fossil fuel and cement companies have a clear responsibilities and business as usual is no longer acceptable. The moral and legal responsibilities of these carbon majors um, were already made clear, thus knowingly continuing their climate destructive operations, beclouding climate science and delaying transition to cleaner or renewable energy will make them liable and people will take them to courts. We will, as an organization and other people, continue to refuse to accept the new normal intentionally peddled by these carbon majors or these big polluters, the climate crisis that Filipinos are forced to live with and face on a daily basis is more than our individual responsibility. It is a result of deliberate decisions made by the polluting companies which had early notice and actual knowledge of the harms brought by their operations and products for at least five decades. Again, if this is not unlawful behavior, then we need to redefine the concepts of accountability and justice. But let me end this. Let me share with you one of the longest banners that Greenpeace utilized and which some things are. When the last tree is cut, the last river is poisoned, and the last fish is dead, we will discover that we cannot eat money. We have to act now. Now means no opportunity wasted, and we have to shift our mindset to shift our behavior and embrace a greener future and a stable climate through clean energy sources devoid of fossil fuels. Thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum. Right. Right. Attorney Yasmina. So once again, to our dear panelists, thank you very, very much for making this conversation productive. Thank you, Attorneys Brioni Iles, Attorney Jinmei Lu, and Attorney Yasmina Paudak Tawano. So uh, in behalf of the organizers, thank you, thank you very much. Right. So just like, I um, um, just want to remind everyone, the attendees, more specifically to the people who have already registered, we will have a virtual networking session. Hello, Bibo. Are you there? Hello, Bibo, are you there? Can you? Hello, Bibo, are you, are you back? I think we may have just had some uh, technical issue there. Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, if I think people might have dropped off, but if he if he comes back, um, please. Um, you anyway, know, so thank you again to all our panelists and indeed to um, Ben and Georgie uh, for the introduction. Um, can I also say um, that after we'll be keeping the Zoom uh, link over on for lunch. Um, and in the afternoon, we have the uh, climate justice workshop, which was uh, a separate registration. Unfortunately, we had to limit it to um, 100 people. Um, so you would have received uh, uh, an email uh, about that. Um, and then we also have a virtual networking session from uh, one o'clock to two o'clock, uh, that's Philippines time or um, 11 o'clock, uh, 12 o'clock to one o'clock. I think Bibo is back. I can hand back over to you, Bibo. Yeah, sorry. I all right, sorry, I lost my internet connection. Yep. You're All right, back. so I think we are on the last part. So, yes, yeah, so I um, just want to share my takeaways. Um, I think government, I believe governments and corporations need to be held responsible and accountable for the climate crisis um, because a government should enact climate policies based on the um, report of Attorney Brioni, corporations should take their liabilities and accountabilities for fueling the, the environment based on uh, Attorney Asmina's um, um, presentation. And together we can make them 
um, take immediate steps to protect current and future generations from fisher folk to farmers, youth to seniors. Let's stand together and make the world a greener, more just and safer place. So I believe also that uh, every human being has fundamental rights, uh, rights to health, um, food and safety. And government should have the obligation to protect our human rights in the face of the climate crisis. So once again, um, everyone, uh, I'm so sorry uh, um, because of the internet connection. So in behalf of Asian Research Institute for Environmental Law, I am Muhammad Ryan Vivo Domado, and this has been the first session of the ASEAN Environmental Law Conference, Stories and Solutions in Challenging Times. Thank you very much once again, and have a great day. Thank you again, uh, Vivo, and thank you also for Greenpeace um, Southeast Asia for your support. Um, so, as I said, just in terms of some um, announcements, uh, the Zoom link will be staying open. Um, so we'll, uh, anyone can stay and we can answer questions and have a, a sort of a, a general chat discussion, if you like. Um, and then we have uh, some things happening um, over lunch until the uh, virtual networking session, which will happen. And again, that was subject to a separate registration and you would have received a, a link um, from Paolo for that. Um, in terms of uh, then the Climate Justice Workshop, um, which is being held at 2 p.m. in Philippine times. Again, that was a limited number of, of participants and there's a separate uh, registration link and that'll be open uh, at two o'clock in uh, Philippine standard time. Um, in terms of questions about certificates, uh, at the end of the conference, we will be mailing, uh, preparing and mailing a certificate to people uh, who uh, can request it. And I would recommend you email us um, if you're requesting a certificate specifically with your name on. Um, the other thing is a link. Um, once we gather the uh, presentations and put them online, we will then put a link to them um, to ensure that people can access the presentations because I think you'll agree with me that they've been quite exceptional um, and a great deal of information. Um, the other thing uh, I would also say is that um, events like this always stimulate um, discussion and ideas and questions, some of which we can't get to today. Um, but I think uh, what we would be very keen to do is organize some more in detail discussions on some of these key issues, um, because I think these issues uh, raise a lot more questions and need a lot more uh, interesting and, and, and considered discussion. Um, but again, can I thank all our panelists? Um, can I say that um, we may be um, uh, putting our videos on, on hold, but um, people are very welcome to uh, type answers in the Q&A box or ask questions still. Um, we'll gather those and keep answering them as much as we possibly can. And, uh, um, but at this point of time, I will sort of invite um, uh, us all to have some uh, lunch or a short break uh, and then come back for the virtual networking session um, in uh, an hour. Um, and then followed by the Climate Justice Workshop. Um, for those who are not registered, um, we will then start again tomorrow. Uh, and again, we start at the same time at 10 a.m. Philippine time or 9 um, a.m. Um, uh, Indochina time um, for, for um, Vietnam and um, Thailand and, and then Myanmar half an hour before that. Um, there is no evaluation form as one of the questions um, has, has been asked, but we will have potentially some polling um, tomorrow and, and Friday. So if you're not registered for the uh, workshop this afternoon um, or the um, networking session, please stay on and, and read the questions and see some of the answers and maybe comment yourself. That's all permissible. Um, otherwise, we will see you tomorrow. And tomorrow we have two very um, full days. Um, in the morning, we have a animal protection panel um, looking at ways to protect um, animals and biodiversity. Um, and in the afternoon, um, we have a, a panel session on uh, protecting human rights and the environment. Um, and then during the day, we also have another networking session. So thank you again very much. Um, if you still have questions, please put them in the Q&A um, or the chat box, um, and we will do our best to, to answer them over the next um, a short while. But thank you again, Timrakasi, uh, Krab. thank you very much, and uh, enjoy a bit of a break, and good luck for those who are able to participate in the Climate Justice Workshop um, this afternoon.
nagpagawa sa CHR simula ng paghahayin namin ng petition na hanggang ngayon ayos naman kahit pa paano po nagkakaroon na ng usad sana po wag nang madagdagan ako ng anak madagdagan na lang ng kaunting usad pa yung petition na hinihahayin namin napangarap ng isang magulang makatapos ng pag-aaral ang kanilang mga anak nung sa ganun na hindi nila maranasan yung naranasan namin sa ngayon. Sa so, palagay ko po ay pag... Gumawa rin po tayo ng isang public inquiry patungkol dito ng sagayon magkaroon ng malawakang konsultahan, malawakang uh, pagsusuri at pag-alam mula sa mga iba-ibay pang eksperto. At syempre, aalamin rin po natin uh, kung tutugon ang mga uh, uh, tinalaga po ninyong mga carbon majors. Ako si Elma Reyes, uh, 37 years old, nakatira sa Alabat, Quezon isang laborer, isang farmer, at ang asawa ay isang mangisda. Ito pong paglalaba ko ay isa lang sa aking mga hanap buhay. Ang isa ko pa pong hanap buhay ay pagsisipi ng kitang na siyang ginagamit ng aking mister at aking kapatid sa pangangisda. Nung pong magsimula ang petition, nadalawa pa lang ang anak ko. Hindi naman po ako nagdalawang isip, go agad ako. Dahil sabi ko ay para din naman ito sa lahat, hindi lang para sa saan. Hindi ko po nakalimutan doon sa petition nung kami mag climate walk sa circle. First time ko rin po na sabi sa amin ay, Uy, nag kayo. May hindi kayo binato sa Manila. Ay, siguro naman po walang mag-aano sa amin dahil hindi naman kami nang gagambala ng kung sinong tao. Tumbaga naman po, pinakikita lang namin sa mundo na may karapatan kami para sugpuin o protektahan ang ating kalikasan. Nagkanak ako ng dalawa sa CHR simula ng paghahayin namin ng petition na hanggang ngayon. Ayos naman kahit pa paano po nagkakaroon na ng usad. Sana po, wag nang madagdagan ako ng anak. Madagdagan na lang ng kaunting usad pa yung petition na hinihahay namin. Pangarap ng isang magulang makatapos ng pag-aaral ang kanilang mga anak. Nung sa ganun na hindi nila maranasan yung naranasan namin sa ngayon. Sa so, palagay ko po ay pag nagtuloy-tuloy nga yung ganyan mga pangyayari. Parang napakahirap para sa amin na marating yung pangarap namin sa aming mga anak pag hindi nagbago ang mga sitwasyon ngayon. Dahil Like sa pag-iisda nga po ng mister ko, kung patuloy at patuloy na ganun lang yung kita, wala. Hindi kakayanin namin ang magpagtapos namin ng aming mga anak. Masaya po ma'am ako. Sabi ko, ay salamat, pinakinggan din. So sobrang saya ko nga ay sabi ko. Hindi yata matutuluyan ng pag, uh, pagdumi ng kalikasan. Parang makakatikin din yata yung magiging, magiging apo ko pa, hindi ko man makita. Makakatikin pa nung natitikman ko sa panahon ngayon. Makakatulong po ang petition sa amin at sa aking mga anak sa pagpapanatili ng, ng panahon ngayon o di man po, di man po mapanatili ng katulad ngayon. At least man po, maprotektahan nila na huwag nang madagdagan pagkasira ng klima para naman po rin ma, makatulong sa aming hanap buhay. Dahil pag po yun ay nasira pa lalo ang klima, Lalo na po, apektado, paano pa po namin matutugunan ang pangangailangan ng aming mga anak at saka paano namin masusuportahan yung pangarap ng aming mga anak.
Yes. Yeah. because of uh, the climate crisis. Sa air, no, sa water, uh, yung vulnerability na din dulot ng mga calamities. Lalong-lalo na kung uh, ikaw ay nanggaling sa underprivileged na background. Uh, right to life, even right to education, right to uh, have a livable home, all rights na sakop ng human rights. Uh, right to health, because especially in Bataan, um, tumataas yung cases ng uh, respiratory diseases na hindi nila alam kung bakit. Pero if you look at it closely, to think na may tatlong cold fire power plants na nag-ooperate, hindi malayo na yun yung dahilan doon. And wala kang laban. Kung yung pinagkukunan mismo o yung kapaligiran mismo na ginagalawan natin ay uh, nagde-degrade, so yung quality of life natin, lalo na ng mga marginalized people, sobrang mamade-degrade din. So kasama dito na yung Uh, access sa uh, quality, sa food, sa education, sa iba pang pangangailangan. So, it's a human rights issue kasi yung mismong access nila sa mga pang basic necessities na apik doon. Climate change din po ang dahilan na kung bakit kami, kung bakit kami wala, kung bakit kami wala sa aming komunidad, kung bakit kami andito sa lansangan at sumali sa mga rally, rally is na nagaganap dahil, oo, oh, pinapatay mga magulang na huminga ng hangin na malinis at uminom ng tubig na malinis din po. And karapatan po kasi natin ang mundong malinis at makatao. Climate change affects rights on healthcare, housing, the right to um, clean water and food. Climate change really does have an effect on our human rights. In the Philippines, we lost more than 10,000 people in two hours. The waters are rising and warming. We are catching less fish. Have you heard stories like these? The Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries to the impacts of climate change. Since the Industrial Revolution began 200 years ago, gases like carbon dioxide and methane have been slowly building up and warming the planet. They are the products of industrial human activities like deforestation, agriculture, and most of all, the burning of fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal. Today, we need to ask ourselves, what can we do about it? In 2015, a group of brave Filipinos took the lead and filed a landmark petition with the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines to claim their right to a stable climate. 
Because of their petition, groundbreaking public hearings are happening in the Philippines, New York, and London this year. 47 big companies, including Shell, Exxon, BP, and others are being investigated. They have been invited to face communities, but none of them have showed up so far. We need to hold them accountable because the outcome of this case can spark hope to vulnerable communities everywhere and give them strength to take action. It will not only benefit the Filipino people, but all of us. Must we wait to lose another loved one? Must we wait for bigger and stronger storms? Must we wait for another tragic story until we reach climate justice? This is our climate story.